All right, so are you familiar already with Intel One API? So you can answer, yes, I use it in existing projects already. Yes, but only the basics or no. So yeah, uh, welcome, good afternoon uh, to today's webinar introduction to One Intel API. Um, it seems like a lot of people are answering no, they're not familiar. So um, that's good that you're here. All right, so a few housekeeping items uh, before we get started um, so that you know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, uh, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters. So to do so, just type your question into that Q&A box down there at the bottom. Um, and then the presenters will be able to address as many questions as time allows for at the end of the webinar. If you have any technical issues with sound or visuals, please let us know by using that chat box. And we are recording this webinar, so you will be able to get the link in your email after the event. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our two presenters today. First one is Dr. Johnny Paul. He is joining us from Intel. He is a technical consulting engineer specialized in software tools for system bring up and performance analysis. His experience includes development of firmware components for motion control on industrial robots used in clinical automation, performance modeling for multi-core processors, and development of hardware accelerators for image processing, face recognition on FPGA, and device drivers for various embedded systems. Johnny holds a PhD in accelerating image processing algorithms on heterogeneous mini core processes from the Technical University of Munich. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Johnny Paul. Thank you, and, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, and our second presenter is Daniela Cleary. He is the senior AI and IoT software architect here at Aeon Europe. He has worked professionally with Linux since 2006, but has worked with it as a user for over 20 years. With 10 years experience in embedded systems, his knowledge ranges from build systems like Yocto to IoT systems and architectures, including AI applications on edge devices. Thank you for joining us, Daniela Cleary. So as I said, you will be receiving today's webinar um, in your email. If you don't receive it, please email us at marketing at aon.eu because you're probably not signed up to receive our newsletters um, if you don't get it to your email. Uh, you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Okay, without further ado, I will turn it over to Daniela Cleary. Take it away. Thank you, Taylor, for the introduction. I'm going to start uh, now on the presentation. The first part of the presentation, which uh, is about our uh, app product. Um, let me share the screen. I'm not sure you're already familiar with our products. Uh, App is a product line that we have specifically for professional uh, makers, developers, and companies that, uh, and to create a path from prototyping to production uh, with our board and gateway based on the same hardware um, that can easy that path for uh, most projects. We have various products at different type of uh, price and uh, features level. We have Intel Cherry Trail and base product like the App Board and App Core and the respective gateways. And we have more recently launched um, App Squared, App Core Plus, and this, as of this year, App Squared Pro based on Intel Apollo Lake uh, processor. The App Square Pro is the newest addition uh, to our um, lower end gateways uh, with uh, the new uh, Atom from uh, Apollo Lake and interesting new features for industrial market like two additional RS-232-485 ports, M.2-2280 for additional expandability and of course also a new M.2 port 30, 42, 30, 52 to support the new modem with 5G connectivity. Also the power input is been extended to 12 to 24 uh, extended range and the other features are similar to what was already available on App Squared. 
together with um, the uh, other app products, we also recently launched more higher performance uh, based systems uh, based on Intel Whiskey Lake, which is up extreme and up extreme light. Both products have incredibly uh, incredible number of uh, expansions, uh, ports and IO. Uh, we added also 5G support on up extreme light. Uh, they both support a dual LAN uh, with Intel network interface cards, uh, also uh, with TSM enabled for uh, real-time applications. And they all include uh, expandability for RS-232 and RS-485. And of course, the 40-pin general purpose bus that's typical on all the app platforms. We also have announced the release of a new product based on the Intel newest uh, core uh, uh, system of chip, Tiger Lake, uh, which will be available uh, from uh, next quarter. And uh, this is introducing the uh, much more powerful integrated graphics, uh, Iris XE, support for 5G. And of course, we have additional PCI Express, PCI Express 4.0 slot and the traditional 40 pin uh, header from the other app products. But of course, uh, still we have two um, Ethernet ports with Intel uh, network interface cards. In particular, we have the new Intel 2.5 gigabit i225. Uh, these products uh, will have uh, four display outs, so it will be very flexible for any kind of application from industrial to retail uh, to uh, AI applications, as it can easily integrate expansion systems mm -hmm design on Intel uh, Myriad X technology using the M.2 2280. And um, many other uh, modules can be added thanks to the incredible expandability offered by this product. Also the um, gateway and base on this product will be available in the same time frame. Um, we have um, already available the AppSquare Pro uh, AppSquare uh, development kit, we will make available soon the AppSquare Pro, uh, which is going to extend uh, the feature of AppSquare with more industrial uh, features and functionalities, as we mentioned in the previous slide. Um, this will make very easier for customer to create industrial products, robots, or anything with more uh, security with the TPM on board, additional COM ports, and of course, the extended uh, voltage input for the power. The other features remain the same, but we have support for 5G to allow maximum flexibility and expandability also for the connectivity. And of course, also Wi-Fi 6. The two um, Ethernet controller for AppSquare Pro are Intel based on i210 with TSM support. And of course, also this board is now equipped with M.2 2280 to allow the expandability also within Intel Movidius Myriad X base accelerators. The upcoming App Extreme i11 will also come in a, a, enable, a compute enabling kit where um, software uh, will be pre-installed, the operating system and libraries and other than the board with, of course, power supply cabling and all the necessary uh, things to set up uh, your system easily and quickly. The software um, that will be integrated into AppExtreme App i11 Edge Compute Enabling Kit is based on uh, Ubuntu 20 of core. Uh, it will use the most recent uh, Linux 5.11 kernel. And of course, on top of that, we'll have Intel OpenVINO uh, runtime pre-installed, Intel Media SDK, Intel One API, and now uh, we'll have better uh, in-depth introduction about it. And of course, support for additional libraries and software like LibMRA, uh, Docker containers, K3S for Kubernetes-based applications. All the other products uh, and all the other app-based products have uh, extensive support for Linux and Windows. On Linux, uh, we have Ubuntu uh, operating system support, but also Yocto uh, project based BSP. For Windows, we have Windows support also with a dedicated SDK for the IO. 
and we have tested uh, extensively multiple libraries for IoT, like IoT frameworks from, from Balena and Mender, which offer also OTA capabilities, other libraries other than MRA. And we have also support for other floating roof pie libraries, robotic frameworks, ROS, and of course ROS2, uh, and then toolkits specifically the ones from Intel, in particular Intel OpenVINO, which was already part of the previous development kit launched in the last year. And now the new One API, which is now included from, which is going to be included now from the next development kit based on Upstream i11. So I will leave now uh, the word to Johnny, who will be uh, providing a more in-depth presentation about uh, Intel One API. Thanks, Daniela. Let me share my screen first. So I hope you can see my screen by now. Um, so um, I'm Johnny Paul. I'm a technical consulting engineer at Intel. And uh, this webinar is mainly about One API and what is inside One API. And this is completely tailored for beginners. So I have tried to put together as bunch of slides, uh, which would give you a quick overview of One API, and we can look at the tools inside the One API framework, uh, the libraries, and how you would program a platform using One API programming language and the tools. So, um, Starting with, you know, um, we've been living in a world of IoT devices, and many of these are smart devices. For example, devices which can, uh, which operate in um, in the hospitals, like medical imaging areas, or smart devices like smartwatches, cell phones, and so on, and a lot of things like electric cars, where we look at autonomous driving and so on. And if you Think that you know if you are a designer, if you are bringing your own product to the market, there are quite a lot of challenges involved when you are working with this kind of devices. Um, so you know that you know there are a lot of heterogeneous things inside this for computation, and despite of this complex hardware, you need to bring your product to the market as quickly as possible. So time to market is definitely one big criteria. You want to keep your uh, investments to a minimum. You don't want to um, spend too much on testing and stuff like that. So code reuse would be one of the main criteria in those cases. And you of course want to have reliable products. Uh, you want to bring reliable products to the market. You want to have, and do thorough testing and debugging. Uh, and this is where one API comes in. You know, this is a package which contains a lot of things which are targeting such kind of customers. So uh, getting started, you know, I talked already talked about the complexity of the hardware we are dealing with now. So if you look at this slide, um, we have CPUs. We've been having CPUs for a very long time. We had uh, standalone designs with FPGAs. And these days, uh, we also have um, a lot of other things like neural network cards, AI accelerators, and so on. And of course, we have the GPUs on board and discrete graphics. So when you look at this entire paradigm, uh, how would you program these devices. I myself have been a embedded software developer in the past. I have seen that many companies hesitate to look into accelerators like FPGAs because they just don't have the knowledge to program those devices. They just lack the necessary resources and uh, they are not aware of the kind of time it would take to design a hardware accelerator. Um, so as you can see here, you know, these things have become so complex over time. We are talking about multiple layers of software stacks and so on. And uh, we want to do everything for our customers so that you can reduce your time to market and come up with more efficient uh, products over time. So the main questions that we try to address here are um, the tools problems here. For example, uh, the kind of different languages you need to deal with, different compilers, different IDEs, debug tools, and so on. So we would like, we, Intel is trying to come up with a package, the, the one API package, where it will try to answer many of these questions that uh, designers are asking today and how you can then use these tools and toolkits to make best out of your existing hardware. So if you see that there is uh, 
need for an FPGA for a uh, time critical task, um, then you should be able to extend your design uh, or your programs to the FPGA without putting too much effort in rewriting everything. That's the basic idea here. And uh, many of the IoT platforms, many Intel processors uh, for IoT customers already has onboard graphics and many customers simply don't use it because you just do not know how to program them. So those are the kind of things we are trying to address. And uh, so what is, what is inside one API as a product? Um, so if you are new to this uh, concept of one API, then this is the slide you need to know. So this is a package which includes um, uh, uh, language uh, runtime, the uh, compilers you need to compile a, uh, the code to run on a heterogeneous architecture, what we call XPUs. It comes with libraries like math kernel library to accelerate uh, the uh, certain parts of your code, which includes uh, math operations, for example. Uh, there are also uh, image video processing libraries, which are all provided for free to for customers. Uh, and um, so when all of that is com combined into one package, that's what we call as a one API product uh, targeting XPUs. And with this kind of a model, we believe we can address uh, some of the questions that developers are asking today on how to handle heterogeneous architectures, which are coming up. There are new ones coming up every day and, and this is a scalable model uh, for such kind of systems. Okay, so uh, getting started with one API, the first thing is uh, how do you program heterogeneous systems? Uh, this is not a new thing. You know, we have asked these questions many times in the past. Um, we've been looking at things like OpenCL, SQL, and so on. Uh, some of them are for CPU, GPU. They have been programming languages for FPGAs. Um, so what we are looking at currently is a new programming model based on data parallel C++. So this is not a completely new programming language. As you can imagine from the name itself, it comes from C++. So um, basically data parallel C++ is nothing but an extension of SQL which is by itself based on C++, which means that developers don't have to learn a new language on their own. There are some constructs you may need to understand. You may need to figure out how you can map your kernel to a particular accelerator like an FPGA or a GPU. But the basic uh, constructs are all the same that you would see in a standard uh, C++, C++ or SQL. Um, and from uh, our side, we provide all the necessary tools to compile and run your data parallel C++ application on heterogeneous systems. Uh, the programming language and the model, everything is uh, fully open. It is not a vendor proprietary model, which means that uh, anybody can actually look at the standards and develop a compiler for data parallel C++. Uh, for example, we have Codeplay looking at a compiler which can convert data parallel C++ or compile data parallel C++ so that it can run on NVIDIA. So all of that becomes possible when things are open and, uh, and accessible to all customers. So uh, moving on, uh, one thing we noticed in the early days is that a lot of customers are already using CUDA to accelerate their applications on uh, NVIDIA graphics cards. So if those customers want to try out our system, no, we don't want those customers to go and rewrite everything from scratch. This is not a scalable approach. So if you have such a requirement, you want to convert your CUDA applications to data parallel C++, you can download our data parallel C++ compatibility tool, which is free. And uh, using this tool, you can actually migrate the CUDA code into data parallel C++. So it's not a compiler. We are actually migrating your code, which means that we expect in real world situations about 80 to 90% of the CUDA code to be converted to data parallel C++. The, the, the tool would then insert some comments in line into the, the code uh, where the migration was not successful. It, it will also give you some hints about what you need to do to complete your program. So with 80 to 90%, this is already quite a lot. And I be, we believe that the customers can handle the rest of it. And then you have the data parallel C++ code, which you can then run on CPU, GPU, FPGA, and so on. 
And uh, yeah, in real world situations, you know, to get the best performance out of an FPGA, you may need to make some tunings on your kernel, but uh, that's only for performance critical areas. You don't have to rewrite your entire code if you want to go from CPA, CPU to FPGA. And that's the, that's the whole idea here. So moving on, um, so assume that you have uh, developed a simple application based on data parallel C++ or even if you have an application which is based on C++ and you want to understand which areas of that code would benefit from going for hardware acceleration. That's the main challenge that the customers then face. Um, so as you can see here in the slide, like a timeline, uh, you can see the host sections which would benefit from hardware acceleration. And often it's a challenge to identify those sections. Uh, if you are an expert with CPU or FPGA, then you can probably look at the parallelism in your code and come up with some assumptions on uh, the, the benefits. But uh, in order to make your life easier, what we provide is a offload modeling tool together with the Intel advisor. So it's called Offload Advisor. The tool can analyze your existing code and give you some projections on how you would benefit from uh, hardware acceleration. So this is how the tool would look like. If you run your code, you can select which accelerator you want to try, for example, Gen 9, Gen 12, or whatever. And then the tool actually profile it, does a kind of instrumentation on your executable and try to understand which are the compute intensive part in your application. And then uh, it has its own GPU models built in for Gen 9, for example. Uh, so it look at the amount of data to be transferred between your program and the RAM and between caches and so on, and try to come up with some projections on how much that would be accelerated if you map that part of the code into an accelerator or a GPU. Uh, of course, if you uh, if the tools think that this is not beneficial for different reasons like lack of parallelism or uh, just because it needs too much of data to run in parallel, then the tool would not recommend those sections for uh, acceleration. So in this case, for, as an example, you can see here, it identified a section of your code which can benefit from GPU acceleration by about 1.8 times. And here you can see, you know, what exactly is limiting your speed up to 1.8x. Actually, the problem here seems to be with the L3 cache. And you see a lot of information here about the data transfer rates and so on. And you can even model a hypothetical GPU in this case. You can play around with these sliders here and come up with a GPU which you imagine. And you can also check how much it would benefit. For example, you can take your application and uh, run it for Gen 9 and then run it for Gen 12. And you can see, you know, some cases you may, be, may not benefit from Gen 9, but things may be different for Gen 12. So they help you to make some educated guesses about uh, your nature of your application. And then with confidence, you can move towards hardware acceleration. Um, a little bit more about the Intel Advisor tool. So assume that you already have a code which you are now able to accelerate using GPUs. The problem does not solve, is, is not completely solved because in some cases you may not be getting the performance you expected from GPU acceleration just because of the uh, nature of your code, you know, data dependencies or uh, simply that it's, it's reading a lot of data from the RAM uh, and it's not possible to uh, accelerate that algorithm on a particular GPU. Uh, or, or it may be simply compute bound, you know, it's, it's working as good as it can. So if you have such questions, what you can do is that you can do the advisor roof line analysis for GPU. This is a new feature we added recently for uh, GPU for programmers using GPU. So what do you see here in this graph? This is actually called roof line analysis, a concept developed at the University of California. It's by itself a complex topic. So unfortunately I won't be able to cover all the details here, but the basics is that there is a two dimensional uh, graph here with arithmetic intensity of your code on the X axis and the giga flops on the Y axis. And these lines you see here are actually the limits of your real hardware, which are calculated or captured through micro benchmarks running on your hardware. The tool does it all for you. And you can see what is the maximum bandwidth of your DRAM, L3 cache and so on. 
So the concept here is that this dot is actually a loop, a particular loop that the tool identified in your code. And from that point, you can see what is the distance to your theoretical L3 bandwidth, which means that in this case, there is some bandwidth available here. So if you increase your parallelism, and uh, in those cases, it won't run into a problem with L3 bandwidth. But if it's already sitting on a roof line, for example, on the L2 bandwidth limit here, then you already have a problem. You know, it may go and hit that bandwidth limit and it won't see an acceleration. And in those cases, what you can do is that you can rewrite your application so that the arithmetic intensity is improved, which means that it is doing more operations with less amount of data. In real world situation, that means that you may need to pipeline your algorithm or something like that. So the data is not often read and written to the DRAM. In that way, you can overcome some of these problems and do further acceleration. So these are kind of ways you can further optimize your code running on accelerators. This is just an example. We have a lot more features in our tools, uh, which I'm not able to cover in a short webinar. Um, the next tool I want to talk about a little bit is the VTune Profiler. This is uh, the ultimate uh, performance analysis tool from Intel. This has existed for a very long time and has matured over time. So uh, if you have, I think many of our, our software developers are using VTune Profiler these days, but if you haven't heard about this tool, it originated first for the CPU profiling and later as time progressed, we are now adding GPU support, FPGA support, and so on. Uh, so you can uh, analyze your data parallel C++, C, C++, Fortran, Python to almost any language you can think of using VTune Profiler. Uh, the tool actually does not instrument your code for most analysis types. So it actually rely on the operating system to understand how long your thread is running. It rely on the hardware performance counters to gather information about your code. Uh, and then all of that data is presented to you in a nice graphical interface. And as you can see here, these are the different analysis types supported by VTune. Uh, if you have no idea where to begin with, then you do a performance snapshot analysis. And then the tool will give you some recommendations about what kind of analysis to do next. For example, uh, microarchitecture exploration would be beneficial if you have a lot of uh, FP operations, which needs optimization or a memory access analysis if it is a memory bound. Uh, you know, if you want to improve your uh, access techniques um, by aligning your data to cache lines and so on. Uh, and recently we added a lot of analysis types for GPU. So you can see the GPU offload analysis, GPU compute media hotspots and so on. And if you are a system designer and uh, you, are, you don't really care about the application running, but if you are a system designer who just want to know uh, how your system behave when you have a complete stack of uh, application running, for example, a complete video analytic application is running with its operating system and everything. And you want to know where exactly is the bottleneck. Is it the CPU itself or the RAM or the IOs and so on? Then you have the platform profiler tool inside VTune, which can do a system-wide analysis, which can run for several hours to days. And uh, you get all the data about bottlenecks and within minutes, you would be able to understand, you know, how you can speed up your system further, maybe going to a new memory technology, adding more IOs and, and stuff like that. Or maybe just the problem is with the CPU itself, you need a faster CPU to, to get better performance. Um, so I quickly talked about the GPU offload and GPU compute media hotspots. So if you are looking at offloading kernels to a GPU, then you really need to learn about these two types. So the GPU offload mainly focus on uh, how the kernels are running on the CPU and the GPU and what is actually causing a bottleneck in your system, which could be data sharing, for example. A lot of data has to be shared between GPU memory and the CPU RAM, which by itself is a problem. Uh, on the other hand, on the compute media hotspots, you can actually go down further into your source code. You can see uh, the even the assembly instructions which are running on your GPU, and you can see line by line how, many, how much time it's taking for each line of your code to execute on the GPU and where the problem is. We had these features earlier for CPUs. If you have used VTune, you may have seen that, and now we are extending those features into uh, GPUs. 
Now, on the right side, you also see a CPU FPGA interaction analysis. This is needed if you are accelerating for FPGAs. Uh, so before we go into that, I have one slide here, which is actually showing how the GPU analysis look like. So here you can see here the, the US CPU architecture. You have the CPU with its RAM, and then we have the GPU with its different caches uh, to the shared memory, and then the GTI interface going to the DRAM. And the tool can analyze how the data is being transferred between CPU and GPU. And in no time, it can analyze your code on the real hardware and tell you where the bottleneck is so that you can focus on that problem rather than making your own assumptions on performance optimization and thereby save a lot of time when it comes to product design. A few words on FPGA side. Uh, so if you want to accelerate your algorithms, your applications using FPGAs and data parallel C++, this is fully supported now. Uh, and um, you don't have to run hours and days of um, cycle accurate simulations like you do for VHDL or Verilog. So you have your OpenCL or data parallel C++ code, which you can compile using our compiler and um, create a bit stream, which then runs on the FPGA. And of course, the performance is critical here. And for that purpose, you can enable profiling in our compiler. And this means that we are actually adding some performance counters into every load store unit. The performance counters are actually measuring how long it takes to load the data uh, or store the data from memory or from other kernels uh, if it's a pipeline system. And then these counters are all chained so that the data can be read out through the PCI Express interface to the host machine. And the VTune running on your host would then be able to tell you how your kernels are behaving, if it's a pipeline system, where exactly is the bottleneck. Or if you have a problem on your caches and memory, then you can see the data and you can try to optimize your kernels for increasing the data reuse and thereby uh, get much better performance. Now with that, uh, let's move a little bit uh, towards libraries. So uh, I already mentioned that our package contains a lot of libraries which you can use. And the first one we will talk about is uh, one MKL or one math kernel library. Um, MKL as such has existed for some time now. The concept here is that uh, a lot of standard math operations like matrix multiplications, FFT operations, vector math, and stuff like that can be accelerated uh, through a particular library. So Intel has developed this library over, it, over time. Our engineers have uh, created target specific implementations of these math operations, uh, which means that if you uh, have a Apollo Lake uh, processor uh, with limited vectorization and tomorrow you want to run your code on a Xeon processor with much wider vector instructions. And if you're using one MKL or math kernel library, you can simply take your code which you compiled for one processor and run it on the next one and you would still get the best possible performance. The library when it's initialized, it actually try to understand where it is running and then try to pick up the right implementation for that CPU architecture. This means that you get the best possible uh, utilization of your CPU, the right vector instructions, the, uh, the right implementation in terms of memory access and, and so on. So there are even some parts in the library which are coded in assembly to give you the best performance. So having or using such libraries would first of all, reduce your effort in designing your product at the same time, make sure that it's scalable and it is uh, with no effort, you can move that uh, software you designed for one processor to another one. And uh, in the past we were focused on CPUs, but now we are extending these functions into GPUs. So you can see here, this actually shows what is inside the math kernel library and uh, the, uh, the blocks which are encapsulated in the orange box actually shows they are the ones running on the GPU. The exact support would vary. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, not all of those functions are available uh, for, for GPU acceleration. So this is something we are working on. And as time progress, we will add support for more of these, uh, more of these uh, math operations on GPUs. 
Okay, uh, moving forward uh, further, the next library I want to talk about is the video processing library. Uh, so if you are developing products which needs a video encoders and decoders, this is the library you need to look at. Uh, so again, uh, most of the video standards, uh, you know, things are pretty much standardized these days. So you don't really have to implement your own encoders and decoders for CPU, FPGAs and, and GPUs. You can just link your code we provide C, C++ APIs using which you can do these operations in a most efficient way and the most fastest way possible. Uh, it is perfect for applications spanning broadcasting, video on demand, cloud gaming, and so on. So if you fall into those categories, then do look at our video processing library. Okay, um, now the next part is about parallelism. So if you have developed parallel applications, you probably know how difficult it is to create and manage threads in your application code. Uh, the synchronization between threads is a problem. Uh, if you haven't used the proper synchronization techniques, then your performance goes down. Uh, handling data is the next problem. Uh, and a and lot of other issues like data logs and stuff like that come along with multi-threading. So Intel introduced the thread building blocks uh, in the past where uh, using this, you can actually define your task and then the, the uh, TBB runtime would take care of this. This is, uh, a lang this is a model you can compile with any compiler and uh, execute on your target. Uh, the runtime would take care of the data handling, the thread synchronization and so on. And uh, in our experience, we have seen that this helped to improve the scalability in real world applications. Uh, just to give you how this could look like in real world, I have a benchmark here, which was actually taken from a Xeon processor. So we try to look at what is the ideal scalability on a on any processor in, in theoretical conditions, which is actually shown here using this dotted blue line. And then we compared that with, uh, with some implementations of different algorithms using TPP. And as you can see here, it, the scalability is pretty good. Of course, it's below the theoretical limits, but it's scaling quite well when we are increasing the thread count from one to 48. And on the y-axis, you can see the speed up numbers. Um, if you're wondering what is happening here in the middle, this is actually a NUMA system with a multi-socket system. So as expected, you know, uh, we are scaling our applications beyond one NUMA node at this point and that means sharing data between nodes which actually brought in some performance problems until 27 28 threads and then it started to scale again so um yeah practically speaking this is still pretty good and um if you don't want to get into the hassles of multitasking multi-threading then you should definitely look at the thread building blocks the next thing, so uh, the one API wouldn't be complete if we if we do not talk a little bit about uh, AI neural networks. So if you have such applications, for example, analyzing video streams of for certain applications, you know, quality checks uh, and stuff like that, then you need to look at one DNN. Uh, so what we have done is, you know, this is a library which actually help you uh, to accelerate your neural network um, algorithms. It helps developers improve productivity and enhance the performance of their deep learning applications. Uh, you can use this library uh, for uh, developing or running your code on CPU or GPU or even both as you like it. And the operating systems, both Windows and Linux are supported these days. Uh, you may also want to look at the Open Vino library from Intel uh, if you want to look at inference uh, AI inference, and you want to accelerate that using GPUs and FPGAs. Now, uh, so with that, we are done with the tools and the library sections. Uh, what I have in this slide is it's it's a few words about how these tools are available to you. So, like I said before, One API is an open programming model, program open language. It is completely available for free to our customers. All the tools, the libraries are all available for free. 
And uh, if you go to the product page, you will see that the tools and uh, libraries are split into toolkits. So the idea here is that you can pick up the right toolkit for your needs based on what domain you're working on. So if you come from, if you have a generic requirement uh, on you're trying to understand how data parallel C++ would benefit, uh, in your design, then go for the base toolkit and you have the most widely used uh, uh, tools and libraries there along with the compilers and everything for data parallel C++. But if you want to go domain specific, for example, there is the IoT toolkit, there is the HPC toolkit and the rendering toolkit. So those contain some specific tools are targeting those uh, domains. For example, we have the Fortran compiler in the HPC toolkit, which is not available in the base toolkit. And if you are into the uh, AI domain, then look at AI analytics toolkit or the OpenVINO toolkit I talked about in the last slide. Um, for licensing and other aspects, you can go to a product page. There are a lot of materials available there, which will help you to learn the concept of one API. And uh, there are source code up available in GitHub. There are links to those GitHub um, repositories in our product page. Uh, there are a lot of webinars available, training materials available where, uh, and you can quickly get started. So this is how the IoT toolkit look like. Uh, those dark blue boxes are, components or tools which are specific to this toolkit and the light blue ones are also available in the in the base toolkit. Uh, we talked about most of these tools like advisor, Intel Prof, Vitune profiler. Um, we did not talk about the Intel inspector, unfortunately. Uh, this is a tool you need if you want to understand problems like uh, memory leak in your code, or if you have uh, problems like thread running into deadlock scenarios, uh, for example, you're using pthreads, semaphores and so on, and if you have problems, uh, then you can use this Intel inspector to understand those kind of problems. And we also provide an Eclipse-based ID if you want to develop your code uh, all within, uh, with the tools provided from Intel. Uh, uh, then the rest are mostly things we talked about, uh, like MKL, uh, DNN, TBB, and so on. Um, yeah, so um, the next slide is actually about the Intel Dev Cloud. So if you want to learn a little bit about Data Parallel C++ and if you have some code you want to model in Data Parallel C++ and, and you want to try it out on a real hardware without uh, getting into the problem of purchasing the hardware, then you need to look at Intel Dev Cloud. So we offer this Dev Cloud infrastructure where we have plugged in our state-of-the-art hardware, which includes Xeon processors to FPGA cards to uh, even the discrete graphics that is upcoming. And uh, you can get free access to the Dev Cloud. You just need to go to the website, which is shown here, and register for Dev Cloud access. And then you can uh, work on the Intel Dev Cloud from your laptops or desktops. Uh, you can download the sample programs from our um, Git repositories from GitHub, and then you can make the changes, whatever you would like to. You can copy that modified code or the original code into the dev cloud and run it there. The code is coming with make files, build scripts and everything. So with minimum hassle, you can get started. And you can then run your code on FPGAs, GPUs, whatever you like, and you can check how that would benefit and how uh, how the programming model looks like, and would this benefit in your applications? And it's all for free. Now, moving forward, um, you know, we talked a lot about one API, its tools, its its programming models based on data parallel C++. So um, the next slide actually talk about some real world use cases. So here I have a slide where we have a customer, United Imaging, looking who looked at the possibility of using one API and data parallel C++ to model some of their medical devices, some applications to be accelerated uh, for medical devices. And uh, based on their experience, so what, what, what they used is that they used the compatibility tool to migrate some of the CUDA code to data parallel C++. And they managed to optimize their application significantly using the, the libraries and the tools we provided. And, um, and the feedback has been pretty good. We also have um, Siemens, sorry, Samsung, um, uh, medical uh, devices who are actually looking at uh, data parallel C++ and accelerating their 
uh, applications using uh, using BPC++. So uh, we are getting a good industry support these days, and uh, we are looking forward to more of these uh, interactions with the industry in the in the upcoming weeks and months. And uh, yeah, so overall feedback has been very positive. We are very optimistic about the toolkit, uh, the tools, and the toolkits itself. Um, the last few words, uh, we already talked about some of these things. So if you want to get started, you go to the One API product webpage and uh, start looking at the toolkits and the training materials available there. Uh, extensive documentation is provided with the tools uh, and there are a lot of code samples you can begin with. Uh, if you want to know a little bit about the industry initiative and uh, how others can, other industries and customers can contribute to One API, then you go to the industry initiative webpage, oneapi.com, and you can find all the details there. Uh, if you think about support, so we have the community forums where you can post your questions and Intel experts like me would answer your questions. This is completely free, but if you want to go for a paid support where you get the priority support and you want to keep your questions confidential, then yeah, that option is also provided. You can get the priority support, which is paid. Um, and there are a lot of academic programs running if you want to learn more about these tools and toolkits. So with that, we are coming to the end of this uh, presentation and uh, I'll hand over this back to Tyler. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for the great introduction about Intel One API. I think it's a great addition to um, Intel already existing uh, toolkits and, and software, um, also in, integrated in the Intel, also as a base, part of the base of Intel OpenVINO for AI, which is already integrated in our platform on previous dev kits. Um, so just to close, uh, on this uh, webinar, I want to remind you that our upcoming product, App Extreme i11 Edge Compute Enabling Kit, will include pre installed software, operating system, libraries, and so on, including Intel One API Base Toolkit. Other platforms that support uh, Intel One API from the App uh, product line, we have all the ones based on uh, Apollo Lake, so App Square, App Square Pro, and App Core Plus which also integrate uh, Gen 9 graphics, as mentioned by Johnny, is one of the supported uh, graphics processing unit. Then, of course, we have support for Intel One API in App Extreme and App Extreme Lite based on uh, Whiskey Lake U um, system on chip. And of course, the upcoming App Extreme i11 with Tiger Lake based system on chip. The setup guides and more information are available on um, the wiki that uh, we have here um, for Upboard, and there are links to the official Intel website for up-to-date documentation. And there you can find the setup instructions for platform that do not have already one API pre-installed. Uh, together with that, you can find in our uh, community more information about app products and receive free support from the community on any other question you might have about um, hardware and software related to our products. And there are extensive to, um, um, guides and tutorials on the app wiki, and you can find links to download for drivers and software from our download section. That is all for uh, the webinar for today. Thank you very much for attending and thank you Johnny for um, giving us this great introduction about Intel One API. Okay, we have some time for uh, Q&A. If anyone would like to send in your uh, questions, um, actually, you know what, I think we got some questions in our chat box. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, put them in the Q&A box. Um, so uh, I'll read the first question for you, Daniela and Johnny. Um, someone asked, do we need to switch to Intel compiler toolchain uh, to integrate one API libraries and existing product projects that use the GCC slash C lane currently? 
Yeah, um, that's a good question. No, the answer is no, you don't really have to use Intel compiler uh, for uh, those cases. Uh, you can go with GCC or Microsoft compiler, but uh, I would recommend looking at Intel compiler because we have seen benefits in using Intel compiler, especially in areas where uh, you are doing some compute intensive things. For if, you, if you think that you would benefit from threading uh, and, and uh, sorry, you benefit from vectorization, then we have seen that Intel compiler actually outperform the others. So I would recommend using Intel compiler, but it's not a necessary to do, to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also just launched a poll. Are you already using our up product project with up projects? So go ahead and answer that when you get a chance. We have another question. Uh, are one API libraries pre-built or do you need to or do they need to be built for a platform such as Ubuntu? Uh, this depend a uh, very between uh, different libraries. Things like MKL uh, has a lot of pre-built components inside. You cannot really go and uh, see the source code in some cases. Um, so um, I don't really have a good answer for that. Uh, but you know, if you are looking at Ubuntu and uh, linking your applications to the Intel libraries and running it on Ubuntu, you shouldn't have any problems. Just follow the product user guides and instructions given there. And we have testing it for uh, Linux and Windows. So no, no there shouldn't be any problems in using Intel libraries on those platforms and operating systems. Uh, I can add something here as of course we are pre-installing on the upcoming App Extreme i11 uh, as it's uh, powered by Ubuntu 2004. I can tell you that the library is installed via uh, apt uh, apt get with that packages pre-built from intel of course some components are not but the, the base and development kit and uh, the base toolkit includes all the libraries pre-built for ubuntu um, so it won't be a problem to start using the tools um, out of the box when you get our product in your hands Okay, uh, we have a few poll questions for you guys that I'm just running as we're doing this Q&A. So whenever you get a chance, please answer. Uh, one more question, uh, will one API replace OpenVINO in the long run? Can you repeat that question? Yeah, will one API replace OpenVINO in the long run? No. Uh, the the OpenVINO toolkit is also part of One API. Um, I did not go too much into the details of One API uh, OpenVINO because of the limited time we have for the webinar. Uh, so uh, it is completely pack of uh, part of the One API package, and we will continue to offer that to our customers. And I also wanted to say one more thing about this. We talked a lot about heterogeneous systems today and GPU and FPGA acceleration. So this also doesn't mean that uh, the CPU support is going down. We will continue to offer full CPU support for all our products as we did before. Uh, it's just that we are extending our products beyond CPUs to GPUs and FPGAs. Yeah, back to you, Tyler. All right, um, if anyone else has any more uh, questions, please send them in now. Um, I believe we have one more poll question. Let's see. Okay. Um, and again, everyone uh, will receive this webinar. Um, it's been recorded, so you will receive it in your inbox. If you don't receive it, you can check out our YouTube page um, after the event, or also you can email us at marketing at aon.eu, uh, and then we can email it to you. So, uh, yeah. We'll leave a few more seconds in case anyone has any lingering questions. Uh, but if your questions were not answered during this webinar, please feel free uh, to also email us um, with your questions later if you think of something. Oh, one more question. Okay, does P4 language figure into plans? Uh, I don't know what exactly that's all about. So it's, it's something I'm not familiar with, uh, so <laughs> I'm not able to answer that question. Uh, to the person who asked that question, if you want to email us and expound a little more on what you mean, then maybe we can connect you with a better answer. Um, yeah, our email is marketing at aon.eu. So, okay, if there are no more further questions, then uh, please.
please. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. And uh, we will see you at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.